Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, finishing up the Ten Commandments with verse 17. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for being our vision. Thank you for uh, coming and opening the eyes of the blind that we may see you, God, uh, beyond the things of this world and into the eternals of heaven. Lord, you've opened up the mysteries of all creation and you've allowed us to see things that can only be seen through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that, that tonight would be no different, that as we open up your scriptures, that you would minister to us in our three-part being, Lord, our heart, our, our mind, our soul, and Lord, most importantly, your spirit would bear witness with our spirit, Father, that we would see your face and see it more clearly. I pray, Lord, that as we open up your word and we partake of your word, that you would nourish our souls where they need, and Lord, that you'd be glorified in everything that's done tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, again, like I said, open up your Bibles, if you could, to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be continuing on in the Ten Commandments and actually finishing up with the Ten Commandments, anyways. So, verse 17 of Exodus chapter 20 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservants, nor his maidservants, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And I love how it recaps with not anything. We should not covet. It starts with thou shalt not covet, and then it lists a bunch of things, but then it says anything. But it goes into specific ones that, that tends to be um, a troubling or a stumbling block for many people. And so we look at that word covet, and it's throughout the scriptures. It's, I think, 28 times in the scriptures in 27 different verses used differently. But it's... Um, this is, this is one of the Ten Commandments that starts to go to the heart, if you will, of things. Where a lot of these are outwardly able to be seen. We know the first four are obviously about things uh, as far as worshiping God and honoring God. And, then, and, and fulfilling the commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the next six go on to those things that are about our neighbors. And, and as Jesus said, to love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you've done these two, you've done all that the commandments have commanded you. So the, these are going into specifics of each of these, but this is no, no different. This last commandment, as we said, has touched on a lot of spiritual as well as um, the physical realm. But this one in particular is one that can be done without others seeing. This is coveting. It's it taking place within the heart. It goes into the roots of the thing. Other sins usually can be seen if you're stealing or lying or, or committing adultery or these other, these other sins that were mentioned. But this one can be done in the heart and, and people can fool you and, and you may not know what's happening, but you can know and God knows for, sure, for certain. The, the first um, Hebrew word that's used for this in, in, throughout the scriptures is, is Hamad, H-A-M-A-D, it's pronounced Hamad. And it's, it's to mean delight in or to take pleasure in something or to, to lust or to covet after, mean, meaning to, to seek after what its appearance is. You've seen it and you want it. And we know that the first time that this takes place in a negative connotation in the Bible, it's the second time it takes place in the Bible, is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant or covetousness, to, to the eyes and the tree to be desired or coveted, wanted, lusted after, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and did eat. Again, this was going directly against God's commandment. Everything in the tree, in the garden, they could eat and this was the only thing they couldn't have and yet Satan allowed them, tempted them to covet after it. She must have been looking at it and given it a second look, and maybe a third look, and a fourth look, and then um, it, it, he he saw this. And Satan often uses these things when he sees us lusting after something and covetousness. It, it'll start to manifest itself, and she it, it comes with the eyes of what you're looking upon. And First John chapter two verse sixteen says, "For all that is in the in the world, the lusts of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life." is not of the Father, but of the world. So these are three things. I've heard it said this way, the lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are, are the things that easily beset us or get us off the track which God has for us, which are spiritual. We're to walk the spiritual journey 
and, and we're to be, be in the spirit. We're to be holy as he's holy, but we're to walk in the spirit, not the flesh anymore. And, and yet these are the things that lure us into the carnality, into wanting the old life or the things that are temporal, the things that we've been freed from, and we want to look back. And yet the Lord says, don't look back. We're to put our hands to the plow and look forward. We're to look to him. We're to, we're to, we're to um, run to the prize. We're to seek God's face every moment in all things. We're to live eternally and eternally minded to walk in hope, to walk in the assurance that we have of the world that is to come, the kingdom that is to come, who we will be, who we are in Christ, we take by faith. And yet what happens? We want to look with the eyes. We want to go back to our eyes and not the eyes that have been spiritually open to the mysteries of God, but the eyes of the flesh. Again, the, the eyes that, that, that we look and we comprehend in our own mind. We start to rationalize in our own mind. And this is the lust of the eyes. We look and we see it was beautiful, just like, just like Eve. She saw it looked at first, the appearance, but then what? It was something for her soul that could make her wise, make her better, make her life more enriched. And, and, and what is she really saying? What God gave her in the garden, everything that was in the garden, literally he gave her, was not enough. It wasn't enough. What God provided was not enough, and so she coveted after something God said that she couldn't have. And this happens in the Bible many times. There's, there's big examples, though. We're going we're gonna to draw attention to one of them right now is David, obviously in the Bible, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. As David is at the time of war, and he's supposed to be in battle. He's at home taking his leave and bored with life, maybe bored with battle because God had given him so much success in battle. Everywhere he went, he had victory. And even the people chanted his, his victories, how successful he was because he relied on the Lord. He always said, the Lord rebuked you, Goliath, and the Lord do this. And he truly was walking with God in the spirit. But what happened is he got back into carnality and got bored with his Christian walk. He lost his first love. He lost his purpose here on this earth. It says in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 11, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Job, his servants, with him, and all of Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. And, but David tarried still in Jerusalem. So he didn't go with his men. He wasn't in the battle. And this is when lust can really start to, and, and, and covetousness can really start to take hold of us. If we're not busy about God's business, we'll be busy about the world's business and want what the world has. And so he's sitting there at home, not in battle where he should be. And it says that it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose far off his bed and walked upon the roof of his house. And far from the roof he saw, or he looked upon something, he shone. His eyes gleamed a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. His eyes were starting to lust already. He wanted what he didn't have. David sent and acquired of the woman and one sent, said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messenger and took her and came in unto him and lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. What that's saying is she was no longer in her menstrual cycle. She was primed for pregnancy. She was ready to have a baby. And he took her in this optimal moment, this fruit, if you will, this forbidden fruit was beautiful to the eye, but it was also trying to, to prosper. And it says in verse 5 that the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent Job saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. Now we know the rest of the story. We won't go into detail of this. Obviously he took his general, this, this Uriah, this man, this faithful man, tried to cover up his sin um, which had come from covetousness, coveting his own general's wife and taking her for his own, and obviously ultimately kills. So this is a root, this is a heart that started in it with a lust or a covetousness, and in this root be began murder and many other sins of the commandments that he violated, adultery and so many other things. Um, another example in the Bible of this covetousness is, is in Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. It talks about um, Achan. And they just had battles, and they were wondering why um, 
they, they went, they spied out the land, and one of the lands that they were supposed to take was AI, not artificial intelligence, but it was called AI. <laughs> and and there was, it was men that, that did not appear to be strong whatsoever. They spied out the land, and they said, you don't need to send all the, all the soldiers. Just send 36 people, and they'll take it over. And sure enough, they did, and they got destroyed. And so, so Joshua didn't understand this because he was sent into the promised land. Remember, him and Caleb had taken a jawbone and killed 10,000 men. They, they easily were, were having victory. So somehow something happened where things weren't going the way that they should have if God was for them. So in verse 21 of chapter 7, Joshua, it says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord of Israel, and thus, and thus I have done. And when I saw... Among the spoils of the godly, the, the goodlies of Babylonish garments, 200 shekels of silver and wedge of gold and 50 shekels of weight, I coveted them. I wanted them. I needed them. Even though their country had been prosperous, they're destroying the Ammonites, they're destroying all these different, these different nations. They wanted more than what God had already given them. And they took these, these idols of their enemy and these things that were against God and they were coveting these these idols and he took them for himself and said 50 shekels of weight and I coveted them and took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it they're searching for the silver and gold you know silver and gold you hear at Christmas the little Chinese snowman that runs around silver and gold and here we are to be honoring God our, our King our Lord our Messiah and the birth and the ushering in of the kingdom of God which is beyond the eyes of man and, and, and opening up and ushering us into his kingdom which is beyond here and yet what do we seek after at Christmas time silver and gold silver and gold so he didn't care that these were idols made of silver and gold and decorated fancily and he took these false gods and God will not be with us if we honor other gods and surely God was not with them in that battle and this is why they lost that battle we know later on in the scriptures, obviously even more so, Israel, even though God is fighting for them and, and doing everything for them, he's the unseen God who's doing the seeable miracles that the whole world is trembling before Israel. And they're giving them victory after victory, but yet Israel, in, in, in having these false gods and these nations with false kings all around them, even though the king of kings, the Lord of lords, was giving them victory over them, they coveted the kings of the other nation. They said, we want a king for ourselves. We want a king that we can see with our eyes. And sure enough, obviously we know that God did warn them against this, and yet they still pursued it to covet and want and want. And so he finally gave them what they wanted and gave them King Saul. And we know what happened there. Obviously, King Saul had many, many problems. And so we can covet things that God does not want us to have, and it'll always bring problems, even if we get what we want. It, it, in the end, it's going to separate us from seeing God. From, from, he holds back no good thing from us. There's no need for us to, to look for the things that others have, to outdo the Joneses, or it, so to speak. Just because someone has something that's beautiful to us, we should never get to the place where we want or feel we need or obsess about that. I can tell you my dad brought his Corvette in. Uh, to church on on Sunday and it's beautiful. I mean, it's got the most my favorite color blue. It's got it, it, it just looking at it. It's it's amazing looking car and I can see where some people would start to lust after these things. And what will happen if I ever went to buy that thing and I lusted it? Well, I, I would not be able to tie that church. I would not be given to the things that are eternal. I would I would certainly be struggling with paying other bills and and so many things that that would start to own me rather than me own it. It would own me. And so it's not for me to have. Now, my dad, he made fine money. For him, he can have it. The Lord says, enjoy the fruits of your labor. You worked. Sure, he's given to my dad those. And he, he even puts it in a proper perspective. As he was talking to me one day, he said, so you're telling me that the Lord has asked us to give basically a tithe in the Old Testament or a 10%, but the 90% we can have? Yes. Yes. Now the Lord in the New Testament says give cheerfully, not necessarily 10%. It can be more or less, whatever. However the Lord puts upon your heart. But don't covet beyond that. Don't, don't go to the point where you're coveting things God hasn't given you. And spend money you don't have. And even, even for good purposes, you're giving to something that's not of God that he hasn't given you to give. Then don't do that. Don't covet the attention of others. Don't covet the things that God hasn't given you. 
be satisfied in those things God has given you. Um, it, today, even as I mentioned, this is the Old Testament. We talk about tithe. This is the old law as we talk about the law in, in the Bible, the Ten Commandments. And yet, the Ten Commandments are perfect. They're still relevant even in the New Testament and even today. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but the law, for I had not known lust except the law I had said thou shalt not covet it specifically talks about coveting and how it shows us the wickedness of it we we now who are saved and born again what a joyous thing that we see what ensnared us before in this life what stopped us from seeing beyond this world we used to just joy in the things of this world and pleasure in the things of the world that captivated us and then incarcerated us and became our god and owned us and it lost its savor. But now we've been freed from that because God has opened our eyes. Christ came to open the eyes of the blind and show us what true value is. And it says this sin gets, this sin in particular um, of covetousness gets to the root of our hearts. The unseen sin from within. Jesus speaks of this when he says, if you even think of harming your brother, you've committed murder. See, this isn't something that can be seen outwardly. This is getting inwardly all of these that when, when in the New Testament. Christ has raised the bar. He says, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already. See, he had already committed adultery in his heart, uh, David, when he looked on Bathsheba. And then all he did is that manifest itself as he, as he pursued it in obsession. And then, it, and then it became realized into actual adultery. But he'd already committed it in his heart through through the sin of covetousness and so the first four we know uh, 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 commandments of the bible are talk about god and love god alone and the next six are talking about love thy neighbor as thyself and the lord lets us be satisfied with what he gives us we're going to finish up with this with this commandment by flipping the side, if you will, the other side of, of okay, what should we do besides covetous? What where is covetousness good? We where, where it can benefit us and actually bring life and open our eyes and actually enrich our lives. Well, Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. So if we covet God, he will give us what's inside our heart, those desires. But it, vice versa, we'll be held back from the bounty of God Almighty. We'll receive curses of this world. And then the Bible says in um, Psalm 112, verse 1, Praise you the Lord. Blessed is, is the man that feareth the Lord and delight or covetous greatly in his commandments. As we seek his commandments, he will order our thoughts. We can go crazy thinking all kinds of things and believing all kinds of lies as we're covetousness and we're looking with our own eyes and listening with our ears and re rationalizing with our own thoughts. And the Lord says, lean not on your own understanding, but on every word that comes from God as he's illuminating our lives and brings sobriety and right thinking. We are, we, we, if we delight, we'll have joy upon our hearts if we look at his commands as a joyous thing, not as a burden or not as something from the past, but no, something to, we're no longer condemned by, but it illuminates truth of what has real value. <coughs> uh, if, we, if we start coveting after our, our neighbor's things, let's put it in its proper perspective of what it really is to them. Let's look at it through the light of the word of God and we'll start to see the lie of it. You know, the Bible says even wine can be coveted after, alcohol can be coveted after and lusted after, but it says in, it's a mocker. And in the end, it's like an, an adder or a snake that's bit you. And will it not cause you to stumble? Will it not cause you to sin? Will it not come after you? Um, so if we seek the Lord's word and his commandments, we can, we and covet them, we'll have truth, we'll have sobriety in our brains. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, follow after charity and desire or covet spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. prophesy. So even, even the gifts can be covetous after, we were just talking about this before church started, the gift of the tongues and these things that may benefit you, but don't benefit others. The Lord is even saying the word of God and, and, and prophecy of God and the foretelling of him. Let's, let's covet these things. Let's covet the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's be ye continually filled with the Spirit of God and desire that. Let, let him be our desire above all things. 
and then we will be satisfied and we will see things the way we're supposed to in the proper perspective and we won't receive the, the, the snares of the devil. We'll be able to get over that temptation in the garden when he comes and says lies to us. Um, we can quickly repent and see the truth of the matter is, no, I have a lot in God. Let's be thankful in all things that the Lord has given us. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. And I want what God gives me and I don't want what he, what he doesn't give me because he's only going to give me what's beneficial and he's only going to hold back what's not good for me. It may be good for someone else. It may be good for my neighbor, but it's not good for me. Then I don't want it. I want what God gives me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the Ten Commandments that are just as relevant today as they ever were. You say no dot or no tittle will pass from your word until the fullness of, of it is complete until your return. So we know we're not under the condemnation of the law by any means. We're under the new covenant of grace that you fulfilled the law. Though you lived every bit of the law perfectly and failed not in one of them. And you tell us to pick up our cross and do the like. So help us, Father. Help us, uh, uh, re give us a clean heart. Renew in us a right spirit. Open our eyes to spiritual things, Father, that we won't covet the things of this world that stumble us and that once stumbled us. Help us, Father, to see the joy of the Lord and in, in, in that we have a hope and an assurance of things not yet realized, but that you've promised. This is faith. Help us to walk by faith and to please you in all that we say and do. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for your, your songs of hymns that you put on our heart. May we bring each other the spiritual gifts that you've given to us, Father, and share them one with another to give to the poor rather than take, rather than covet. Let's become those that you've called us to be, Lord, the blessers, the peacemakers, the ones that are satisfied in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.